About five years ago, I showed one of my kids a clip by Physics Girl of an ultrasonic levitator. He immediately wanted to build one, so we bought the kit and we spent most of an afternoon soldering it together. He was pretty proud of himself and he decided to make a science fair project on sound. I highly recommend you watch the Physics Girl clip as she gives a great explanation of how it works, but essentially there are two opposing sets of ultrasonic transducer emitting waves of 40 kHz ultrasound 180 degrees out of phase with each other. That creates standing waves of low and high pressure where a light object can hang out. The bowl shapes that the transducer sit in helps focus the sound. Fast forward about four years, and I ran across an interesting paper in the journal Nature of a group at the University of Sussex who took this concept further, way further. Essentially, they used a phased array of ultrasonic transducers to move a styrofoam ball through the air so quickly they were able to draw floating images in midair. Of course, I had to build one. The first step to building this was to figure out how it worked. The paper was a great help here. Each transducer needed to be fed a 40 kHz waveform, but with a phase relative to the other transducers, calculated to ensure that the high pressure areas converge at a specific point in 3D space. Moreover, the signals from the downward firing transducers had to be 180 degrees out of phase with the ones firing upwards. The function here takes the focus point as an argument and for each transducer calculates the distance from the focus point to the transducer, multiplies that by the so-called wave number that converts the distance into a phase, and then limits the resulting phase to plus and minus 2 pi. Once I had a rough handle on the physics, I built a simulation of the system to see if it was even possible to do what I wanted. Here I'm showing how the resulting waveforms interact with each other for 1 to 10 pairs of transducers. The focus point is in the middle of the volume. You can see how the waves reinforce each other as more transducers are added. In the final design, I chose to use 100 transducers for each of the top and bottom arrays. The simulator calculates the phases for each of the transducers and then determines the pressure wave magnitude for every voxel in the 3D volume. Each voxel in this case is 1 mm cubed and the total simulation volume is 100 by 100 by 145 mm. The simulator uses CUDA and OpenGL to dramatically speed up the calculations. This animation is showing a particle, the white square, moving along a pre-programmed path. This simulation looked about right to me. It showed all the standing waves as expected, and it showed that it was possible to calculate the phases of the transducers to focus the sound, and that it was possible to move the focus point. With that validation, I decided to build this thing. The design consists of two identical boards, each with 100 transducers. Each board also has a controller and memory, and something to calculate and generate the phase signals for each transducer. A Raspberry Pi is used to control the two boards. The transducers I source are 10 millimeters in diameter and rated to 40 volts. To drive each transducer, I used a MOSFET driver configured as a full H-bridge to essentially double the power the university group had used, figuring I'd be able to move the bead that much faster, which actually turned out not to be the case. To generate the transducer signals, I decided to use an FPGA. This was partly because I needed a lot of I.O. pins, more than 100 on each board, and also because I wanted to be able to calculate and change the individual signal phases at a rate of 40 kHz, something that seemed to be a stretch to do on a micro. I had hoped to find an FPGA in a TQFP package with enough I.O. and gates to be able to run all 100 transducers on each board, but such a thing didn't exist. It was simpler just to stick two FPGAs on each board and have them each run 50 transducers. I also added double EEPROMs for each FPGA to store images. On one of the boards, I put a Raspberry Pi W as the main controller. The Pi sends SPI commands to all FPGAs simultaneously. To keep the FPGAs synchronized, one of the FPGAs generates a 40 kHz synchronization pulse that all the other FPGAs listen to. Because I was a little paranoid about all the EMI I might be generating, I decided to use RS-45 differential signaling to send the SPI and sync signals from one board to the other. To illuminate the foam ball, I use four 3 watt RGB LEDs at each corner of the ultrasonic array. Each color is driven by dedicated LED drivers. The drivers can be PWM to change the relative brightness of each color. Lastly, there are four DC to DC converters, one to step the 24 volt input voltage down to drive the transducers, two separate 3 volt and 1.2 volt converters to drive the FPGA and associated logic, and one 5 volt converter to power the Pi. Layout was done on a four layer board. A simple Python script positioned all the transducers, drivers, and associated decoupling caps. 
Other than that, there's not much special about this layout. This is the fully populated PCB. I did make a couple small mistakes on layout, but overall the boards turned out well. One small trick I learned with that early ultrasonic levitator, the transducers have a polarity to them. While there is a little plus sign on the underside of each transducer, it turns out to have no bearing on reality. You essentially have to test each transducer to determine which pin is positive. Testing is pretty simple with an oscilloscope. Just hook up the transducer to the scope, poke the transducer cone with a little piece of plastic, and mark the pin that gets you a positive going spike like the image on the left. The FPGA code is not super complicated. An SPI interface allows the Pi to send commands to the FPGA. One of those commands loads point in color data into a FIFO. A controller then coordinates the processing of each point into phases that are then used to drive the transducers. There's also a separate module to drive the LEDs. To do the initial test of the system, I used my simulation code to figure out the phase for each of the transducers. This phase data was then sent to the Raspberry Pi that then sent SPI commands to the FPGAs. The FPGAs then output phase signals to the transducers. This simple approach allowed me to easily fine tune the algorithm for determining the transducer phases. I just had to change some PC code. It was also possible to determine if the ball could actually be moved. It was a relief to see that I could. At the moment, the precision of the system is 0.1 millimeters. The next step was to have the FPGAs actually do the math to determine the phase for each transducer based on a desired position command. Most of the code to do this is integer math, but there are a few floating point operations in there as well. The simulator helped a lot to debug this portion of the code, especially the timing. What I ended up with was a pipeline that took in the desired ball position and then calculated the transducer phases for all 50 transducers connected to the FPGA. This took 94 clock cycles at 20 MHz. Note that these calculations are done 40,000 times a second. Now that the FPGA was doing the math, I was able to test how fast I could move the ball. This video is showing the ball taking 60 milliseconds to move 60 millimeters in one direction, or about 1 meter per second. When conditions are right, I've been able to double that speed, but I can't do it reliably, and I don't have the patience to further tune the system. Here, I'm drawing a line by moving the particle back and forth quickly. Circles are rather easier to draw as you never have to slow down and stop. I wanted to replicate the butterfly animation the original researchers had made, so I created a simple scripting structure that allowed me to show a particular set of points for a specified number of times and then jump to the location in memory that contained the next animation frame. This butterfly animation fits in 8000 words of memory, about the max I could put in the FPGA. I've not gone around yet to using the external EE prompt to store data. In this clip, the butterfly is moving and rotating while animating. I added a simple preprocessor to the points read from RAM in the FPGA to multiply the 3D points by a rotation and translation matrix. This was all done with integer math. The Pi can then send commands in real time to the FPGA, supplying the coefficients to this rotation and translation matrix. You can also scale the object down in size. For this clip, the Raspberry Pi is sending these coefficients every 100 milliseconds to the FPGA, causing the butterfly to move and rotate. One last thing. If you recall, there are some RGB LEDs on the board. This allows me to turn on different colors of LEDs at different times in an animation frame to essentially color the styrofoam ball with light. Each point has 7 bits of color information associated with it, which was all I could fit in the FPGA's internal RAM. And here you're seeing each butterfly wing with a different color. So that's pretty much it. You can see there's some distortion in the shapes. I think I've ruled out any error in the firmware, and I'm attributing these distortions to the cheap transducers having trouble adjusting phases so quickly, but it could be something totally different. As to next steps, there are a few things I'd like to do. I'd like to try moving multiple balls at the same time. It should be possible. Also, the original researchers were able to turn this into a haptic device. If I modulate the amplitude of the focus point at about 250 Hz, that should stimulate the nerve endings in my finger allowing me to feel the 3D points. That's definitely pretty cool. And lastly, I should be able to create a very directional audio speaker using these phased arrays of transducers. I'm not sure I'll ever try that, but it sounds interesting. Anyways, let me know what you think. Happy to answer any questions.